Good evening, everyone. My name is Jim Wabandato. I'm a program officer at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. And one of my roles as a program officer, I provide for community presentations talking about various land issues as they relate to uh, individual ownership, tribal planning, and uh, the like. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, certainly been uh, kind of squirreled away here in Little Canada in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. And in order to meet the needs of Indian landowners, I had put together a series of interactions and engagements with landowners and other land professionals. The idea being that uh, critical information should be shared uh, regardless of whether or not I'm able to get to a tribal community and then also to provide an avenue for uh, landowners, agricultural producers, and tribal leaders to uh, get questions specific to the issues that are confronting them. Uh, in a standard webinar, it's often a presenter like myself or some other person kind of covering an issue, spending about anywhere from 45 minutes to 75 minutes, and then providing for roughly 10 to 15 minutes of uh, question and answer. And I wanted to provide a more direct avenue for those folks who are interested to get the answers they're looking for. And to accomplish that, these town halls are very question driven. It allows for you to submit your questions to the chat feature and then address, have them addressed in a more direct fashion. Um, Sorry about that. Cheryl, are you gonna be able to join? Yeah, it's, we're already started. I'm already filming, so <laughs> this is gonna be on the recording. All right. Um, I'll email one just to make sure you have it. All right. Oh, sorry about that, folks. Um, another guest will be joining us and she will help to navigate those discussions. Uh, let me get this off to her so we can have her join us shortly. I apologize again for the uh, technical difficulties here. All right, uh, back to what we're looking to accomplish. So what I have envisioned for the long term of this is that we can create an online platform for Q and A that people don't have to wade through a 45 minute presentation to get a singular answer uh, that would allow folks to quickly link to what they're looking for. In working with the general public over the years here at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, there's usually something that's driving them to uh, reach out for information, uh, including the fact that uh, the American Indian Probate Reform Act, which provides for a generally universal uh, probate for Indian land, uh, was passed in 2004, went into effect in 2006. And here at the foundation, we will still get people here in 2020, 2021, who are surprised that this is in place and they have a lot of questions about what the APRA law does, or maybe they've been impacted by APRA and now they've got questions about why this happened. Why is it that my sister got something and I didn't? Um, and we go through and address those concerns. Again, uh, generally until something is important, uh, I would say that people aren't necessarily, you know, able to prioritize that in their lives and, and address that in a more meaningful way. So this is going to be something that uh, will allow that to happen. Like I said, in the long term, I can see this becoming a uh, click answer and we'll get uh, these different snippets with the different answers addressed in a way so that, you know, you, again, you won't have to wade through that. Tonight's issues, like I said, is knowledge, skills, and abilities. 
I've got a uh, landowner and an activist for uh, landowner rights who will be joining us and she can help share and, and shoulder some of the responsibility to help make sure that your questions are answered, that some of the issues that you might find interesting are addressed. Um, in preparing for this tonight, I really wanted to kind of address the fact that as a landowner, as an agricultural producer on Indian land, knowledge about your situation is critical. Um, I strongly encourage people to read, to research and find out, you know, what the game looks like. What are the rules of the road that have been passed by Congress, by your tribal government? Um, and within those structures, then what are the policies that executives, whether they be Department of Interior or the uh, chief of the tribe, the chair of the tribe have put in place so that uh, the Natural Resources Department or the Realty Office may implement as they affect your tribal lands. Strongly would encourage people to talk to other landowners uh, in sharing some of the resources tonight. I'll show that there are platforms and uh, avenues to do that. And finally, ask questions. I mean, ultimately, there are a lot of resources out there. There are people who want to make sure you succeed in managing and owning your Indian land. And once you start asking questions, uh, I think you'll be surprised at how quickly the answers can uh, begin to come to the front. Um, and in addressing your questions, I think that was probably one of the most important lessons I learned here at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. Is a lot of times I may not have the answer that they're looking for. I may not have any answer at all per se, but by virtue of listening to what their situation is and maybe getting them one or two steps closer, giving them some answers uh, that help them better understand how the situation got that way have been uh, important, I think, to those individuals. I would say that once you've got been armed with information, it's important then to furthermore, go ahead and start becoming actively engaged in owning and managing your Indian land. Um, I think when you look at becoming engaged, it can be as simple as talking with your family members. Uh, one of the family groups I work with, uh, the second generation of landowners who are in their 60s now, uh, and some a little older, they talked with their parents. They listened to what was important to them and then transferred that information to their kids. And now they've transferred that information to their land, uh, about the land and their family to their grandkids. Uh, in doing so, then uh, they put together a program that they would call uh, Air School, E-H-E-I-R, as an airship. And so their air school is designed to basically have a meeting once or twice a year so that they can talk about what's going on, make sure that, you know, that next generation understands why it's important for Indian land in the family. Um, furthermore, once you've become engaged, it becomes easier to work and understand how co-owners in fractional ownership um, have an important role. Uh, you can look at addressing what's going on in the parcels of land you're interest or that you have a ownership interest in, but it's also an opportunity to perhaps put together or work with a landowners association or a Lati association in your tribal community because uh, the tribal leadership is going to do what's in the best interest of the tribe. Uh, for the most part, I would say they will be consistent with what is important to the landowners, but there are going to be times when the tribal government and the individual Alati are not going to have the same interests in proceeding. And so knowing what's going on allows you as an individual producer or as a landowner to um, have the information to protect your own interests. And then finally, as you perhaps become much more motivated to do, change the rules so that they have a greater impact in allowing you to do what you'd like to do, uh, you can be active at a national level. There are two groups that 
specifically work with individual Indian landowners. It's the Indian Land Working Group. Uh, they've been around for uh, more than 20 years. And on Facebook, uh, there are some folks who've come together under a banner called the Indian Landowners Party. And they look to exchange information and do educational sessions similar to this. Um, it could be considered that uh, the Indian Landowner Party and the Indian Land Tenure Foundation are doing the same thing. But personally, I would say that that's not a bad thing. Uh, they're going to address issues that we don't. We're going to be able to provide resources that they may not. And ultimately, both of our goals, all three of our goals really, is to make sure that you as an individual landowner, as an agricultural producer, can do the things in Indian country that you want to accomplish. Uh, Cheryl, I see you've joined us. Would you like to uh, introduce yourself and maybe share uh, some of your experiences as a landowner and how gaining knowledge and skills in Indian land ownership has allowed you as a landowner to be more productive or effective, you think? Well, thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody. Uh, I serve as the Enumudi project manager for the Numu Alati Association, which is a nonprofit formed by the landowners. And then also we have the Enumudi, in our language means our people's land cooperative. And we put together, or the landowners put together a cooperative in order for us to do economic development. And both of these organizations enable us to deal with the fractionation and uh, speak with one voice. But as far as we're concerned, fractionation is the government's problem. We uh, uh, feel that there's uh, great power in numbers. And at times, if you have a, a hundred owners on a, a fractionated allotment, when it comes to stats, uh, writing grants and stuff, that is a benefit because it appears to be a large community. And on the other hand, uh, what we have done, and we have worked with the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs superintendent, uh, because they are unable to provide the services to us, we used our Inumudit co-op to lease our four allotments that are part of our Inumudit project. Uh, that encompasses 640 acres of public domain allotments. And what we uh, have uh, obtained grants through our nonprofit and our co-op. Um, through an, a USDA equip grant, we uh, were able to uh, install a well, which we've never had water on our allotments before. We put in fences and access roads and are going to be putting in our solar uh, pump to our well and also some pipelines to cattle troughs. Some of our land we plan to use for grazing and some of our land we plan to use for organic seed farm. And uh, we have a project going right now funded by the Native American Agricultural Fund for the restoration of our traditional foods that were overgrazed. And so uh, in summarizing as, as uh, easy as I could, because we've been at this since 2014, and the uh, Indian Land uh, Tenure Foundation and the Intertribal Ag Council have been with us through, throughout that whole process. And we have found that uh, we're not alone and you shouldn't work alone because uh, with partners like them, uh, that's why we have been so successful. I'll give it back to you, Jim. Okay. <clears throat> Well, I had mentioned that there are, that uh, learning and reading are critical. And so of course, uh, in that the Indian Land Tenure Foundation is uh, putting this out, wanted to show and share some of the resources that we have available online. So let me share the screen here. Um, and so we've got uh, an area on our website for publications. Uh, we do have a lessons of our land curriculum. The curriculum is designed to uh, address K-12, 
although I think some of the lessons that are included certainly can help anyone who's interested in land issues. But in a more practical sense, uh, since our beginning at the foundation, we have put together publications called a message runner. The message runner is intended to be a plain and direct uh, way to address specific issues so that it, again, helps people to understand what the issue is, how it can be, um, how to understand what is going on, and then to take action that helps support and advance their own interests. Um, you can see through here, starting at one, we've gotten through message runner 11 now. Um, and each of them, again, is not released on a specific schedule, but released to address specific issues across time. Uh, for instance, I brought up uh, message runner five, which is uh, cutting through the red tape. Uh, this is what it would look like on the cover. And in talking with landowners, I know one of the reasons I bring this quite frequently is that it's not easy to understand the information that you get from Interior. Uh, when the Department of Interior sends you a trust inventory or they'll send you a quarterly statement, there's a lot of information in there. But when I talk to individual landowners, usually they'll alert me to the fact that they don't understand what they're looking at. And so um, I would say probably seven or eight times out of 10, it is pretty much put right in the garbage, the round file. And, and it's unfortunate because I think Department of Interior is trying to communicate with landowners, but the message isn't being received all of the time. And in the intervening years, I know, um, the Bureau of Trust Funds Administration, as well as the realty officers have made a concerted effort to share a way for landowners to better understand that statements that they receive. So in Message Runner 5, on page 5 and page 4, we actually provide for a way to decode some of that information. Uh, last week, Cheryl and I participated in a uh, landowner session out west. Uh, I say West in that I'm in the Twin Cities, but we participated in a landowner session and I talked with one of the organizers today and his major concern is that they suggested people bring their title status reports. And most of the people who got that message said, well, okay, I can get a title status report, but I don't understand any of the information that's in there. And so when you're looking at knowledge and skills and abilities as a landowner, Again, ILTF and a number of other folks put together resources to help uh, bridge some of that gap. In this particular instance, uh, this is what a trust inventory uh, can look like. And on top, it'll show who the report is for, uh, what their um, information is, and including their tribal or their uh, IIM account number. In this case, you know, this is a made up number, but the first three will usually refer back to a tribal community. Um, interestingly enough, um, most people won't pay attention, but that you refers to an unallotted Indian. Um, I don't see and have not met really any A's, which was an original allottee. Uh, and then sometimes you'll see other numbers in other characters in there, uh, sometimes an X an X might refer to a non-Indian spouse who had acquired those interests prior to the American Indian Probate Reform Act being passed. And so again, there's a lot of information in there. Uh, 344 specifically refers to, um, let me see in here, it's on here also, but um, Shannon County, so it must be Rosebud? No, Pine Ridge, there it is, land area. So you'll see a land area code, a number, but then you'll see a land area name. So in this case, Pine Ridge, the tract ID. So this is a specific allotment and it shows where it's located, how much acreage, how much ownership interest they have. In this case, uh, just over 1%. And so all of that stuff kind of gets broken down. I know some folks will better understand a decimal, some will better understand the fraction. And it really comes down to um, just making sure that eventually you have a good understanding. Now, when this is laid out, these two pages face each other. 
and it makes it much easier to understand, but you can see um, how these different pieces get referenced. So when I'm looking at a report like this, I can see that uh, this was uh, intestate probate. And as a landowner, if you needed additional information, perhaps you've lost some of your records, you would be able to look at uh, this trust inventory and see the case for your probate that you inherited the land through and perhaps get a secondary copy from uh, the agency to uh, better review some of the information on uh, how that land came to you. Where that could become important in reviewing the probate is that the American APRA provides for a couple of things that sneak up on people. One is the single heir rule. So when there is less than a 5% ownership and somebody does not write their will, uh, when the probate is conducted by the Office of Hearing and Appeals, uh, the probate judge will go through that, see that it's less than 5% and give it to the oldest eligible heir. If you'll recall early in our conversation, I kind of made a comment that, well, see how, I don't understand why my sister got land, but I didn't. And it would often be able to be traced back to the fact that the sister is actually older than me. And so as the oldest eligible heir, she got a little small fractional ownership interests. And if there were anything larger than, larger than 5%, that's where I would have gotten any land that I received in coordination with my sister, also still getting her share of that 5% as well. Um, another time when this can be important to go look at the probate is uh, the second snag that sometimes catches people with probate, even with a will, is that you have to state that you want this land to go to your heirs, to your devisees as tenants in common. Because if you just say to equal shares to my kids, the judge is going to be required by the law to give it to those kids as joint tenants with right of survivorship. And that is important in a couple of different ways. Joint tenancy with right of survivorship means that in all practical terms, the last Indian standing is the one who's going to get that interest that my mom or my dad may have had in its entirety. So if it was a 10% interest with five kids, I may have 2% and we'll all have 2%, but I can't give it to my kids because it's not a remainder interest. It's not something that I can pass on unless I happen to be the last Indian in our family to be alive, at which point I can give all 10% to my kids or do something else through a will. So again, these are reasons why knowing how the law is written and how it has an impact uh, can affect you. Um, we've got Message Runner 2 that deals specifically with APRA. Uh, we've got Message Runner 5, which uh, is where Cheryl and I have our uh, long-standing relationship in working with her a lot, T co-owners. Um, and the idea is that there are additional ways to deal with fractional ownership outside of uh, just filling out your interest or non-interest in uh, a lease that is being offered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, through an auction process. There are ways to take that back. Cheryl, could you address um, kind of getting involved and in what needs to be understood so that um, people can take ownership of those lands and do things with them? Well, what we did, um, we sort of asserted owner managed interest where um, we can do our own lease. For example, we did our, um, we did, um, our co-op leased 640 acres for our Enumo Deep uh, project. And that way um, the co-op could uh, manage several of our projects for us. And uh, the co-op board members are also a Lattes. And uh, when uh, the co-op leased the land, the allotments, that distribution went to the landowners through their undivided interest. However, uh, the Bureau 
was not set up to deal with us. So we did our own distributions. And then any revenue that is generated under our co-op is a separate issue. It is considered non-trust and taxable. And the board decides uh, whether to uh, make a distribution and it's called patronage distribution to the members or to the, um, to, the uh, to the members account. I believe it's, uh, it's sort of a uh, equity account where the money where the money sits there and accrues until the board decides to distribute it. And then they take a, a percentage for administrative fee fees so that they can uh, we can purchase you know supplies, whatever we need. And that has given us a lot of flexibility in the management of our allotments. And the superintendent has asked us to do the distribution again this year. This is our second year we've done our distributions. We use our credit union. We set up our bank. And uh, through the credit union, they have what they call bill pay. And so we uh, make up a journal voucher. And then we uh, uh, use the undivided interest percentage, like uh, Jim demonstration demonstrated on your title status report. And we make the distributions to the allottees. Uh, we feel that <clears throat> this is a way to empower ourselves. I'm not saying that that's going to work in other areas or other regions, but for us, it works well. And uh, the Bureau for years had leased our land for nothing. They uh, did not assert any lease compliance. So our land was drastically overgrazed. And when we first started this in 2014, our association leased six allotments and because they were so badly um, overgrazed. And then we let them rest for three years. And uh, last year for uh, on our allotments, we did a regenerative grazing project where we had 175 head of cattle come in <clears throat> and we uh, separated the 160 acres into 40 acre paddocks and rotated the cattle around. And our attorney advised us uh, with the, uh, uh, through our lease, through the co-op, to just set up an agreement with our uh, contractor who we were going to, uh, who contracted uh, for, through the agreement to lease his cattle there. And uh, the agreement was in a 40 acre paddock. The cattle would only stay there five to seven days, rotated around to each paddock for the 640 acres. And we generated revenue for the first time ever off of that. Those funds went into the co-op and those uh, monies <clears throat> belong to the co-op. However, the members of the co-op are all allottees. So this is all driven by us. And so we, um, this year, we leased the allotment for 187 head of cattle. However, because of the drought and the uh, heat wave we had, there wasn't enough foliage out there. So we, we, lost, we lost about $2,000. And so we're considering letting it rest this, this next year. And as you can see, you know, that empowers us to manage our own land. We can manage it better than the federal government can or ever has managed it. Now, Cheryl, you had mentioned that um, you're managing it, you're bringing in cattle. You'd also mentioned earlier in your conversation that uh, bringing in outside partners helps. Can you talk a little bit about some of those outside partners like Intertribal Agriculture Council or uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service? Yeah, um, we'll start with the Intertribal Agricultural Council. Um, they are a great partner and they dedicate um, 
they have a staff person that has uh, been with us throughout our whole projects. And she goes out on the ground. We, we sort of treat her like a professional witness because she testifies to the condition of our lands. She's been out on the ground. And we, um, what IAC has done for us when we put our steering together, um, steering committee together, uh, they hosted, they hosted our meetings. Indian Lantanier Foundation came in and provided meals and also paid for our meetings space. And we didn't have any money at all until we started getting funds from, we applied for our first grant through the Socially Disadvantaged Group Grant with USDA and we were funded. That allowed us to do all our strategic planning. And uh, then we also had another partner called the Northwest Cooperative Development Center who came in and helped us with our bylaws and our articles, uh, facilitated our meetings uh, through the strategic planning process. And it's a very important to plan because if you don't know where you're going, how much it's gonna cost you, and when it's gonna be um, your investors, or if you wanna, well, a bank is an investor. If you want to uh, submit a platform or any to any entity, you need to have something that tells them that you know exactly where you're gonna be. And we have developed our business plan. We have hired uh, attorneys for our energy we're looking at uh, doing the uh, solar project so that we're off the grid. And uh, we're also, uh, we have several engineering firms that have helped us. One engineering firm is a native firm that's been with us a long time too. They helped us with our water situation and our, uh, provided an electrical engineer to help us identify our renewable energy resource needs. And so we have uh, another engineering firm who has helped us analyze how much water we're going to need for our products, which is really important when you're in an area where it's drought. And, uh, you know, we're looking at putting drip systems in uh, dealing with climate change through our regenerative grazing projects. <clears throat> it's a very complex, comprehensive project, but it is so rewarding as uh, landowners to do it yourself and not have anybody telling you what you can and cannot do on your land. <clears throat> sure, I'm going to follow up on that because we've talked about some pretty complex strategies in what the Inumu Deep project has accomplished. And you've shared some of those stories, but uh, I looked for the graphic and I could not find a copy I might have. Can you talk a little bit about uh, some, even some of the basic work you did in, in creating a visual map of who the landowners are in your uh, workspace? Let, let me see if I can pull that up. Um, <clears throat> Just give me a minute here. Um, While you're doing that, I'll kind of uh, share my screen real quick. Uh, so I had mentioned that there are a couple of organizations. Uh, in the current state, it's much easier and much less effect, uh, less much less expensive to reach a large audience by using Facebook. Um, and so uh, I think that there are probably things that have gone back and forth about how good or how bad Facebook is. But uh, for me to get information out, I feel like with our smartphones and community pages, it's replaced the moccasin telegraph. So when I uh, set up arrangements to come to a community, I'll try and reach out to the community uh, Facebook administrators and and get some announcements out there so that people know what's going on. In this case, uh, what I'm sharing 
is the Indian Land Working Group. Like I said, they've been around for quite a while and uh, have gone between providing advocacy, holding uh, conferences, and uh, have kind of had ebbs and flows uh, depending on resources and leadership at any particular point in time. Uh, but the uh, Indian Land Working Group is a resource that you might be able to get information from, uh, as well as the Indian Landowner Party. Uh, Indian Landowners Party is, um, in some ways it almost feels professionally staffed at times. Uh, there are uh, uh, some individuals who put quite a bit of effort into sharing information. I know at one state, at uh, one point this summer, uh, they began looking at doing some uh, collection of historical documents and reports as they relate to Indian land, uh, just as the Indian Land Tenure Foundation tries to tackle how leasing, trespass, valuation of a, and appraisals of uh, Indian land transactions has an impact. Uh, the Indian Landowners Party also uh, is looking at some of those issues because these are landowners. They know firsthand, just like you, what some of those pitfalls look like and how, um, how they see a way out to take on stronger ownership. Have you found it, Cheryl? Yeah, I did. I found... Uh... You should be able to share your screen if you... Okay, just a second here. Okay, I'll share the first one. I have two, two, um, two overheads here. This is, this is the first one where we took the title status reports and we devised a map to show all the landowners on our allotments. And as you can see, uh, on allotment, this is allotment 15, there were one, two, three, four, five, six landowners, and each there's each of their undivided interests there. Major landowner, Sean Cook. And so let's go down to allotment 18, uh, where I'm a landowner in allotment 18. And as you can see how fractionated our allotment was, we have an estate um, on uh, one, See, my, my grandmother, uh, Charlie Gill, uh, left this to my grandmother, and my grandmother um, left it to four of her kids. So it was divided into four. And then, of course, boarding school, everybody got married. So in this uh, one quarter, you can see my cousins from the Tulalip tribes. There's five of them. And then over here in this other quarter, you'll see the Reno Sparks Indian Colony are my other cousins. There's three of them there. And then down here is the, um, uh, let's see here, allotment, my mother's uh, quarter here. And as you can see, here I am, I'm a tribal member of the Round Valley Indian Tribes. And then these are my brothers and sisters and my, uh, two sisters or my brothers and sisters are enrolled in the Fort Goodwill Indian community. And then over here we have our uncle and it's still in an estate, but the prospective heirs are, you can see here, there are six of them. So this allotment 18 is really gonna be fractionated. So what we did was, if I can just close this, this is, after we all decided to do, um, let's see, gift deeds. Look at allotment 15, after they, uh, they did some gift exchange, Sean Cook now, look at his undivided interest, how big it is. On allotment 16, you know, there's three owners after that. Allotment 17, you can see that Cynthia Proctor, she's major owner, but her daughter and her son are the other owners. Same with this, they're all related. And what we did on my uh, on our allotment, this is still in an estate. Uh, this, our cousins didn't want to um, gift exchange on theirs. And uh, one cousin did. And as you can see here, uh, Cheryl Loman, me, I have 30% now or 0.30.
my one cousin gifted it to me and retained a life estate. And all my brothers and sisters retained the life estate. And then to protect that, we did that so that we could make decisions and have the majority, uh, the majority permission of the landowners to do business. And uh, one example is negotiating the lease. You only need the majority landowners uh, consent to lease. And so what, uh, what we feel is really important for everybody to analyze their allotments this way. That involves going, getting a track history report that goes back to the original landowner and you trace it forward. Uh, I'm an owner in uh, another allotment 44 that's really fractionated. And when we went back to the original, the, after the original landowner, there were six. And you know, when you break it down like that, you know, the families can start resolving their fractionation of their allotments. You don't set yourself up to fail by looking at one allotment. You know, you look at like this quarter here, and the, these, these uh, our cousins here from Tulalip tribes, they can decide if they want to give each other life estates. And if they don't, they can decide if they want to sell it. And I'm sitting out there saying I will buy anybody's. I've already let them know I, I'm interested in buying out their undivided interest. But they're not willing to do that. And that's fine. You know, it's not a problem. But, you know, it's, uh, I think that the fractionation too, like I said before, is the government's problem. And uh, this is what we've done to resolve ours. And so Cheryl, what I really, one of the things I heard underlying the, the situation you just laid out is that ownership and management can be related, but they can be done in a, in a way that um, isn't exactly the same. So that your cooperative allow, the gift deeds allow for you guys to consolidate fractional ownership and make decision-making much quicker and more efficient. But in your cooperative, the previous landowners as they were, your brothers, your cousins, uh, they still maintain a right and a role in the cooperative, is that correct? Uh, yeah, let me pull up another, um, <clears throat> another, uh, I'll show you here, just a second here, let me find it. And so what I'm trying to pull, draw out in this process for you guys and the audience is that, again, ownership is, is one measure, but productive use through management is another important and critical measurement. And so in getting those two things to work together, the ownership does not always have to match the management and productivity. And it gives you greater options. That's probably one of the lessons that we're going to share as a result of the uh, co-owner management project. There are other issues that I would like to see, for instance, creating a new class of Indian landowner, uh, the corporate owner, that would allow the land to stay in its Indian status. Uh, I know one of the other things that the Indian Land Tenure Foundation is looking at in the long term is, are we better served as tribal communities to have restricted fee lands where you'll have ownership in a restricted status rather than having to trust and work through uh, the federal government because they own the land as a trustee on your behalf. Um, if we wanted to even go further outside the box, what about looking at uh, indigenous title, tribal title that would, um, again, completely remove Department of Interior and the federal government from the process and allow you to be the landowner. So there, there are other things that we're looking at. I see Cheryl's ready. Okay. Okay, this is um, this is in the co-op. You can see this is uh, United States Department of Agriculture. And um, when we got our equip grant, 
Uh, we also had to put together a farm operating plan for 2020. And so at that time, we only had 16 stockholders. And here are the entities they are identified as follows. And as you can see here, there's the percent interest is static. It's just the same. And how you come up with the percent interest, there's uh, you, you take uh, 1 16th, that's uh, divided, 16 divided into 100 comes out to this percentage. Now, um, the board decides who the members are. And um, two of these members, Bernal Pollard and Corey Quiapama, <clears throat> Corey Quiapama is a member of the Muckleshoot tribe. They're prospective heirs. They are not allottees, but they're our board members. So they are members. And we are going to be adding seven new members. And when we do that, uh, the board has already approved by resolution through the co-op to accept these members. And then what we do is we have uh, our members fill out a, uh, oh, it's a, it's a AD247 agricultural form. And they fill that out and then it goes over to Farm Service Agency. And then our percentage interest decreases. You will note we are not using the landowner, uh, the allottee undivided interest. That is used for trust distributions. This is used for taxable distributions. And it's, I believe it's, uh, it's called uh, uh, patronage refunds. <laughs> um, and it gets a little complicated setting up the chart of accounts to do the accounting on this. But did that answer your question, Jim? Well, I think it just helps to illustrate again the fact that as Indian people, there's a lot, of, there are a lot of options that we can look at. Uh, we don't have to just wait for the uh, auction at the Department of Interior to lease out our Indian land. There's a lot more that we can do, but it takes information. It takes uh, going out and getting answers to help us get to that point. And so, as you've described these different stages and steps, I think that helps to illustrate that, you know, it can get kind of complicated, but you've experienced a good deal of success already in taking on owner management of your allotments. Well, Jim, as I said before, we didn't do this alone. I have partners. I mean, I have attorneys. We've had uh, attorneys uh, volunteer for us, but um, the best attorney that understands Indian trust and all of this is Margie Schaff. <laughs> and uh, she's uh, out in Colorado. She assisted us with our water rights paper she assisted us with our uh, management options uh, for a lot of teas that I presented at our conference uh, last week. And uh, so that has developed uh, infrastructure for us to fall back on because, or actually for our future generations, because, you know, I'm not going to be around much longer and I want to set everything up so that when our youth take over, that they have it uh, in a place to where they can access the resource and they understand it. Because it is rather complicated. I've encouraged people to submit questions or, or comments through the chat. And I haven't gotten anything specific. So wondering uh, if anyone wanted to perhaps unmute themselves and directly ask a question, or again, you can certainly put it in the chat and I can grab it. Uh, we're coming up with about five minutes left. Um, and there's nothing that stops us necessarily from uh, ending early. Again, I don't wanna make people just hang around because we've slotted some time on the calendar, but um, I think I've accomplished most of what I wanted to do today, which is the acquiring knowledge, developing skills, and applying that can certainly 
provide a very rewarding experience, uh, whether it be preserving and protecting, you know, your, your grandpa's land, whether it be taking grandma's land and um, using it to produce some revenue and income for your uh, family or to do other things in your family. Uh, there are certainly endless options and there are a lot of resources to help support that process. But without you taking the, the reins and really diving into this yourself, it's not going to happen. I can tell you that Cheryl has quite a few family members who do various things, but uh, she kicks ass and she gets after it to make sure things happen. And, and I can tell you that uh, a lot of the success they've had in her project is because she helps to make sure that it does happen. Um, and so you need somebody in your ownership group who's going to take on that kind of role. But again, it takes knowledge and skills, applying those resources and finding resources to help support that, whether it be organizations like the Indian Land Tenure Foundation um, for land ownership and land management directly, whether it be the Intertribal Agriculture Council to tackle the technical assistance needed for agricultural projects. There are resources out there I would certainly encourage you to uh, uh, send out to the organizations and, and help track down answers and find people who are willing to help you. Um, Cheryl, did you have any parting comments? Any last words for this evening? Well, um, just as an example, when the, the people from Shoshone-Bannock, uh, the Lattes, reached out um, to the Intertribal Ag Council, they wanted us up there to give a presentation to them. And so naturally, Jim, and then Land Tenier Foundation came, and the Northwest Cooperative Development Council uh, Numu Alati came, Enumu Deet board members came to support those people. And that's what we're all about is helping each other. So if anybody, um, if anybody needs any help or questions, you know, contact Jim and uh, he will uh, coordinate a meeting like this so we can share information that's going to help somebody. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay. Um, so uh, give it one last chance for folks to ask questions, whether uh, directly or through chat. But uh, while I'm waiting for that, I'll say that uh, December is a short month. Uh, we're looking at doing gift deeds as the topic of discussion. That will be on uh, Tuesday, December 14th, again at 6 o'clock Central, 5 p.m. Mountain and 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, the session on gift deeds is going to be moderated by me at the Indian Land Tenure Foundation. And the expert to discuss the issues of gift deeds is going to be Daisy Minthorn. She is a realty specialist at the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. That is uh, something that you should keep an eye out for. Uh, we'll be getting information in the next couple of weeks on that uh, session. I appreciate Thank everyone you. coming in tonight. Yes, Cheryl. Yes, I noticed that Philbert and he just hung up Gilbert Bailey from the San Javier Alatis Association was on. And yes. I just wanted to give my regards to him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there he is, Philbert. Gilbert. So, See well, again, you can get it, make us say something. Would you be willing to, Philbert? He's still on mute. 
Well, this concludes tonight's session. I'm going to turn off the recording, but I won't necessarily stop this. So if uh, the recording may be kind of a hang up for folks, uh, certainly stick around. And um, I know I'll be available. Cheryl may well as well.